Good evening and welcome. I'm Heather Gates Masudi. I'm a board member and officer of the Churchill Club, and I'm also managing director of venture capital relationships at Deloitte. Tonight, we present four outstanding women leaders at our fourth annual Women Tech Executive Roundtable discussion. We're fortunate to have with us Shala Ali, VP of Solutions Delivery, Microsoft IT, Robin Denholm, CFO of Juniper Networks, Lori Goler, Vice President of Human Resources and Recruiting at Facebook, and Barbara Holzefeld, Managing Director of SAP Labs North America. Marjeet Wenmakers from Andreessen Horowitz is not able to join us tonight, but heroically stepping in, we have the one and only Ann Winblad, co-founder and managing director of Hummer Winblad Venture Partners, here with us to lead the discussion. I also want to thank Microsoft, who has once again opened their doors to us as a host and a sponsor. Let's have a round of applause to thank Microsoft for this, making this program possible. Tonight's program is co-hosted by three other important nonprofit organizations. All of them are dedicated to advancing women professionally. They are the Anita Borg Institute, Ostia, and Witty. Representatives, <coughs> representatives from each of them are here, and I encourage you to learn more about their work. Let me briefly tell you what's next at the Churchill Club. On July 18th, we present Jeff Weiner, CEO of LinkedIn, and Ari Emanuel, co-CEO of William Morris Endeavor Entertainment in conversation with Kara Swisher of All Things D. Next, on Wednesday, July 27th, we present a pre breakfast program called Information Overload 2.0 with Jonathan Spira of Basics and Derek Dean of the Exeter Group in conversation with Dave Needle. Then on August 3rd, we present Inside Google's Search Office, an evening with Matt Cutts, Ben Gomes, and Amit Singhal. Danny Sullivan of Search Engine Land will moderate. A complete list of programs can be found on our website at churchillclub.org. A couple of dates to save if you can. The evening of September 15th, we present the first annual Churchill Club Awards to acknowledge exemplar, exemplary achievements in the areas of innovation, social benefit, collaboration, and mentorship. And on September 16th, we present a day-long conference entitled Igniting Innovation and Mastering Change. Both of these outstanding events will be presented as the finale of our 25th annual anniversary celebration year. And my final announcement, you'll find Twitter codes in your printed programs. If you're tweeting tonight, please use pound sign Churchill Club. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Ann Winblatt. Ann is a legend in the tech industry. She's also the co-founder and managing director of Hummer Winblad Venture Partners, a leading venture capital firm focused on software investing. Ann will lead the conversation tonight, but she also has license to add her own insights and observations as well. This will be Ann's fourth time moderating the Churchill Club Women Tech Exec Panel, and we're extremely grateful to have her join us tonight. Please give a warm welcome to Ann Winblad. Well, I'm happy to say that tonight we are seeing the new face of Silicon Valley and the tech industry as a whole. Uh, Lori, Shala, Barbara, and Robin all have important roles in the technology industry. Many of the decisions that are going to affect your companies, be they startups or their competitors or collaborators, are made by the women that are sitting around me. We, in many ways, all three of, four of them represent the face of Silicon Valley in other ways. One was originally from Pakistan, one from Germany, one from Australia, and one from Los Angeles. Uh, so in more ways than one, we see exactly how the tech industry in Silicon Valley works. Uh, because we have such great leaders uh, here in front of you tonight, I've asked them to start out by giving us their thoughts about the state of the technology industry today. As you all know, it's a pretty exciting year for almost every company in the tech industry. And I thought I would give them each a chance to talk about their lens on uh, innovation and the dynamics of the industry today. Shala? Well, let me, let me give you a perspective from an IT lens. When you look at um, 
information technology and how it enables the strategies of the organization that it serves. What we see from a Microsoft IT perspective is our, that we need to be in a real hurry to move Microsoft to becoming a real-time enterprise. And a real-time enterprise is an enterprise that will have information at its fingertips. You're not really looking at delays, you're not looking at latencies. What you have to do is put together the solutions that deliver real information for decisions to be made mo in, in moments, not in hours and certainly not in days. And in order to do that, what we have to do is digitize our processes. So every company is made up of hundreds and hundreds of processes. And so what we're looking at from an MSIT perspective is to sit back and say, what are those processes? Who are the end users? How do we digitize those? And how do we then move Microsoft, which is well on the road, to being a real-time enterprise, to being a 100% real-time enterprise. So it's all around enabling the business. And so technology is not for technology's sake. It's about enabling an enterprise to be able to do its job better. Yeah, so, um, so from my perspective, if I, if I sort of talk about the industry at large from an innovation perspective, I think... Um, uh, innovation is one of the most exciting things um, on the planet at this point. We need a lot of good news at the moment given the financial um, uh, world at large. And I think uh, what will drive not only productivity but new uh, realms within um, many different industries is the innovation that can be delivered. And I think uh, from a technology perspective, what we're doing here in the Valley as well as in other parts of the world is, is really just the beginning of what can be done. And so from my perspective, I think uh, I have a huge amount of optimism of what we can actually deliver uh, over time with uh, focus and energy on different uh, technologies that are out there. So I think uh, from, from a country perspective, innovation is a, alive and well. But I think from a, from a global perspective, innovation is alive and well. And I think that it will continue to be so. Well, I think through a, you know, I'll look at it through a social lens which is that you know, we've thought for many years that social was sort of the, the way of the future and the world was moving towards social. And the last five years or so has really been about proving that out and building the infrastructure for social around the web and in the world and kind of helping people understand what it means for uh, companies to design around people and for things to happen around people. And I think we're just at the point now where we'll start seeing um, you know, really a very diverse ecosystem and robust ecosystem of companies and competitors who are starting to move in the same direction and who are building on the platform. And I think the next five years will be largely about building engagement and value for the people who are already involved, uh, you know, sort of using the infrastructure over time. So, you know, I think we'll see, while I, while I think it's a trend that will certainly continue and is, you know, a big part of all of our futures. I think you know the way that companies will start thinking about building for social, social by design, rather than social as bolt-on at the end after you've developed a product will change uh, quite a bit. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of the innovation, and I think we'll continue to see that over the next several years. So the way we look at it is uh, in terms of innovation that helps largely you know, in the business uh, space. and. Um, but we're seeing some really interesting dynamics in the in the area of business software, which is um, I characterize it around um, um, the, the the consumerization, um, uh, the sort of convergence between consumer and business software, um, the the convergence and the coherence that is required from that, and our industry is also um, characterized in a lot of consolidation. So uh, what I mean by that is uh, the convergence is really the kind of blurring of the lines between uh, what you use in your private life as a consumer um, and the business line. So um, you know it all happens on the mobile devices um, where where consumers interact with businesses which then brings very different challenges in terms of how coherent processes need to be from the enterprise all the way to the consumer and how that interaction works. And there's a, there's a new generation of people coming into the businesses who then have very different requirements into kind of how 
business software needs to be interacted with because they're used to you know iPods and iPads and those kinds of things. And uh, at the same time, if I look at our competitive space, you know, five or ten years ago, it was very different. Um, you know, and it's it, we're going through consolidation at the same time. There's new competitors popping up, so it just makes for a very different and dynamic makeup of of our industry at the moment, which is going through just a a kind of game-changing stage at the moment. So, Laura, you're in charge of people at um, Facebook, but everyone on this panel is in charge of people at their company, both recruiting them, managing them, motivating them. Words like enablement, empowerment, um, even you know, building your own social capability at your company. Whenever Silicon Valley is in a boom period, there is an extraordinary war for talent. Lori, talk to us about the talent that you're building at a relatively new company um, relative to SAP, Microsoft, or even uh, Juniper. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, really there's always competition for the best people, and I think there always is in the Valley. And you know, we even saw this in 2008 when it seemed on the surface like no one was hiring. There was still a lot of competition for the best people. And so I think there's, uh, you know, I think that's just part of the world that we live in. And um, it is definitely intense right now. It's been intense, I think, for a while now up here. I expect it to get worse, actually. <laughs> um, you know, there are a lot of startups that are kind of coming online. And, uh, you know, I think that a lot of people have a lot of confidence in their ability to start a company, which is fantastic. Uh, but it will definitely create a lot of pressure in the, um, in the short term. Um, you know, and I think we're at a place where we're looking for a lot of builders. You know, we're looking for people who had startups or who would otherwise be starting a company or, you know, have somehow shown that they have an inclination to build. And, you know, those are, those are people who are going to be really important in terms of driving innovation um, going forward. And I think, you know, technology doesn't drive the innovation. It's the people that drive the technology that drive the innovation. So you've got to make sure that you've got those people. Uh, and lots of people are out looking for them right now. So, yeah, Robin, are people starting to wear hoodies at Juniper? <laughs> <laughs> I think there are a lot of hoodies. But, um, <laughs> but in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the point about technology, I mean, if, if you boil it all down, at the end of the day, innovation can only, is created by people. It's not a, a company. It's not an organisation. It's not, it's not the machines themselves that are innovating, right? It's actually the people who are... Um, coming up with the ideas and then enabling them to happen, right? So, so I think at the end of the day, no matter what the economic climate, the, the talent uh, that you have on any particular project, on any particular area that you're working on is, is the most critical thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and you know, I'm the CFO toy, it, it's actually more critical than the money, right? So um, you can have uh, less money with great people and get something done, you can't have the other way around. Lots of money with uh, less great people and get, uh, you know, great innovation. And so. great leadership within those people. Yeah, well, right? I think... Wait, yeah. That's a part of what you're implying yeah, as well. Yeah, I think yeah. leadership is definitely um, part of that it, equation. It's yeah. leadership. It's also how do you keep those... Um, employees and team members engaged and motivated as Focused. you're going through all these various <laughs> cycles of the economy. How do you yeah. make sure they really stay enthusiastic about what they're doing and, uh, you know, sort of willing to keep sinking their teeth and going the extra mile? Yeah. But what do you look at in those resumes? So let's take Barbara and Lori. We'll mm -hmm. get to Shala and Robin in a second. You are both brand managers at Disney, Coca-Cola, now Barbara, you're running SAP Labs. Laura, you're running People at Facebook. It's not exactly a straight line up the ladder. W what do you look at in those resumes and, and how was your career shaped to, to build into your roles? So what I look at, I mean, obviously there's certain skills that are required for any role, but I look at them almost as the, the kind of the baseline. Uh, what I'm looking for in People is really the, do they have the, the passion and the energy um, to, to drive things? Are they willing to go the extra mile? Are they willing to drive change? Because that's something that in our industry is, is just a given, right? Um, and, you know, are there people who are willing to, to try something new, who are willing to take some risks um, and to, to really drive change and who are 
open-minded because, uh, and we just talked about that today actually, where we are going through a lot of changes in our industry, which also means organizations change a lot. And uh, so what I'm always looking for is, you know, are people open-minded about what change might come their way and are they willing to try different things, um, which is something that I've experienced, you know, along the way as well and has, uh, that, that sort of open-mindedness has really worked. So Shala, were you looking for a job and Microsoft seemed appealing because you were working for Ginny Rometty at IBM who might be the next CEO there? Mm -hmm. Or did Microsoft come calling? How, how did you jump from, micro from IBM, which is a mm -hmm. very good company, to Microsoft? Well, I think I actually didn't plan to join Microsoft at all. I, was, uh, I got a call and it was, the, I think, the fourth or fifth time Microsoft had called me in two years. And I thought, well, finally, I've never been to Seattle, so why don't I just go for an interview, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll ask your daughter lately if she'd <laughs> like this decision. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and um, so I came out for the interview, and it was grueling. I mean, the first interview actually was at 6 a.m. And we went from 6 till 6 with, you know, a little lunch break in between. And I was treated like royalty, so, I mean... I have to admit, the shallow part of me found that very appealing, right? I mean, <laughs> I, was given, I was given this, you know, there was a town car taking me from building to building and so on and so forth. But there was just one part of it that just, cla I, I really didn't know if I wanted it or not until one thing happened. And that was their decisiveness. The decisiveness with which the decision was made, I was there on Friday, flew back on Saturday, the offer was in front of me on Wednesday. And I thought, I mean, I was amazed because that would not have happened at my previous company when an executive is brought in that fast. And we were finished by the following Friday, and then I had a non-compete, and they were willing to wait six months. And I thought, my goodness, this is a company I want to join. Did they give you a puzzle to solve? They did day? not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they did ask me some challenging questions, but they did not ask me to write any code or whatever. I actually joined in the services organization. And, and I've not, you know, for me, um, the whole Microsoft culture is so addictive. It was one of the best decisions I've ever made. But, you know, I think what really did it for me was the decisiveness with, with which that one action happened. And, of course, I could tell that there was a good fit. So, Robin, you made the biggest leap. You crossed the entire Pacific Ocean. <laughs> so, uh, you know... How did you get to Sun Microsystems from Toyota? Yeah, no, I was actually with Sun in Australia okay. uh, for a few years, uh, and they actually moved me to the U.S. for two years in 2001. So, um, so I obviously can't count because I'm still here. But um, you know, but that was a huge move. And uh, from my perspective, joining Juniper was all about the culture. Um, I, you know, after the first two discussions, I knew it was a company that had a huge amount of focus, energy, passion about what, what, what we're doing in the, um, in the networking world. The people were phenomenal in terms of every single person that I met before I joined uh, were, uh, as I said, p passionate, enthusiastic, knew where the company was going, what needed to be done to get there, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and also um, had huge aspirations. I mean, when we're a company that's not just um, producing networking gear, we're going to change the planet with that. So, so, uh, and what we do, I think, is very, very important. That came through in you know the first three conversations that I had. So, um, yeah, that was great. Lori, what's the number one thing you look for in a candidate for Facebook to sort of move them on to the? to the six-hour, six-day interview that Shala went through. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, hope, I hope we're not taking anyone from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., but I'm going to check when I get back. <laughs> <laughs> that seems really grueling. Um, you know, I think for me, I'm really looking for someone who has taken something that's working just fine and thought, this is working just fine, but I can make it even better, and has actually shown that they can do that. So someone who can actually, you know, take something from this works great, to, wow, this is like a step function different, and nobody kind of saw it coming. It's redefined something in some way. How, how do you sense that? Is it by the personal interview? Can you read that in the resume? I mean, it's, both. it's both. It's both. Kind of, it, you know, it depends on uh, the person and what they've been doing and where they've been. And, uh, you know, I think there are some markers, like they've started a company or they've, you know, run certain things within larger organizations. And then, you know, I often ask that question in an interview. 
And how do you make sure the cultural fits there? I mean, particularly with a younger company, um, I'm sure there are stated norms in the culture and making sure that you don't dilute that. How do you, how do you make sure that happens? So I think um, this is actually a big part of our culture, being able to build and to think ahead and to think forward and to try something different. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, usually sort of the, if they've shown that they can do that in the past or it's a passion of theirs or it's something that they're interested in, they're probably going to be a pretty good culture fit. You know, if they're sort of the kind of person who's always tinkering or, you know, is building an app on the side or just launched their own iPhone app or, you know, sort of someone who is always just involved in making something better is a pretty good fit, I think, for what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you all think we're doing on this diversity challenge? Shala? <laughs> so when you look at it from the, a representation of women in the industry? So from your lens. That's right. Um, so in my personal opinion, I think we've been at this. That would this, be Microsoft. That, yes. And, and yeah, <laughs> from a Microsoft perspective. And I have, I, I, you know, I've been working on women's issues all of my life. And I actually thought that we would be in a slightly better position today than we, you know, when I, when I go back to the 80s and, you know, we were setting up women's conferences. And so when I look at the Fortune 500 and we often talk about the numbers and certainly the numbers are way better than they used to be. But I think what, what I think we need to do is slightly adjust, and, I've, you know, and we're certainly doing this at Microsoft as well, the way we approach the whole issue, if that's what we call it. Um, we're still approaching it with old tools. And I don't think we've made as much advancement with the old tools, which may not be as relevant. And let me give you an example of exactly what I'm talking about. As a new generation comes into the workforce, I don't think they have as many gaps as some would imagine in terms of, of skill gaps. So you'll hear and you'll read articles. I just read one in the New York Times the other day which said, well, women don't ask for things. They need to ask for things. Or women aren't ambitious. They need to be a little more ambitious. And, the, and I think the insinuation there really is, if, we, if only they would fix a few of those things, the problem would get fixed. And my perspective is, we have to stop trying to fix the women, we need to fix the system. Because the women don't need fixing, and by the way, there are lots of women who are not ambitious, and there are lots of men who are not ambitious. There are lots of women who don't speak up, there are lots of men who don't speak up. This is not unique to just the female gender. What it does, in my opinion also is, have us focus on the wrong set of issues, which is trying to fix the skill gap, and I don't think that skill gap or the soft skill gap, you know, the lack of ambition or whatever, is really that relevant. It is the systemic barriers that we need to apply ourselves to, and that's certainly what we're looking at at Microsoft as well. Is so, you know, it's been good to have the conferences where you, you know, you you sort of focus on having your voice. Um, heard at the table and so on, but we need to focus on the systemic aspects. And so stop fixing the women, fix the system. I think one thing I'd like to see change is I'd like to see more women in engineering programs and colleges. Um, the numbers actually here are really disheartening. So I think we're at about, don't quote me on this, I might get it a little bit wrong, but I think we're at about 18% now across yeah. the yes. nation in the yes, US. And in 1985, it was about 35%. So not only has it not moved, it's gone drastically in the wrong direction. So you know, if you think about sort of where the biggest pool is and where you can draw from, it's getting smaller. So um, do you think that's an international phenomenon as well? I, I know it's a US number. I don't yeah, know what's actually happening it is. as much yeah, It is. Um, it doesn't look that different in Germany, for example, um, where <laughs> I just think the the, the question is, what can we do about it, to mm -hmm. your point, in terms of can we, you know, reach out more to the people who are in school at the moment to kind of make them aware of what opportunities lie ahead for them and how to capture them, how to go after them. Um, I liked your point about, you know, let's not fix the women. <laughs> um, what we've seen work is also this, um, it, it's much less about the conversation just amongst the women. It's much more the, the, the dialogue in the organization and sort of opening the eyes to also different skill sets that are on the table and the kind of increasing importance of some of those um, sort of more relationship skills. Um, and, uh, and I think there's still a long way to go, but I don't think it, it can be a quick fix. It's much more a matter of um, how can we, on the one side, raise the awareness for the dialogue 
um, within the current organization and current generation, while at the same time reaching out to the younger generation and sort of talking about kind of what it takes and you know how could they capitalize on some of the opportunities and encourage more females to go into more technology-centric roles mm -hmm. and studies. Mm -hmm. So let me ask a question of the panel here then. You know, we talk a lot about, um, in many forums where, you know, I speak about the, the lack of enrollment in computer science and the fact that it is, in fact, shrinking worldwide. But from a technology perspective, do you really need a computer science background today to be in the technology industry? I mean, I often sit back and assess my own team and say, how many have a business degree? How many have a liberal arts degree? And it's not the same as assembler code. Right? I mean, once a, I don't even know how many in the audience know what assembler code was, <laughs> but you had machine well, language. We, we do. <laughs> it was a little bit different there, but I just, I just, it's just a one, I, I'm not asserting the position, but I'm just wondering if we're letting the lack of enrollment of women in technology and computer science be a reason when it may not have to be. But I'm just wondering, what do you think about that? Actually, then that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, personally, I don't have a computer science degree either, no, no. Um, and kind of came to technology through the back door. But um, as things are sort of getting much more consumerized yeah. in technology, you know, what are actually the skill sets that people will need in the future, and is it really the the hard coding development things, or is it more type of assembly putting the integration things together? Yeah kind of skills? It's a really interesting question. Well, we're seeing in startups, and I think there, there's been a lot written about it, about especially in, in the enterprise software business, that the engineers are taking a starring role again. Um, it, you talked about, Barbara, the consumerization of the enterprise, and certainly Facebook is a consumer company, and also consumerizing the enterprise. Same with Juniper. There's no company on this podium that is not really trying to build very easy to use products, very rapid to deploy products uh, that are coming in through the endpoints of the company versus the CIO. That's where all the new stuff is. And you have to build that stuff. And it's iterated constantly, so it's not just build once, go away. So the starring role of the engineers kind of stays longer than it has before. So there is really a remaking of the startups in you need a lot of engineering talent, which is extremely competitive right now. I mean, as an example, uh, a large public company called up the other day and said, do you have any struggling companies <laughs> that have a lot of engineers? We don't care what no. we do, we'll buy them just for the engineers. <laughs> so, you know, they're looking for six packs of engineers that you know, <laughs> can build things. So there is a moment in time here, and this happens frequently in the technology right. industry where you know, the, the front of the bus has to have a lot of engineering talent. Now, that alone won't make you successful. And certainly we're looking for more natural athletes than the heads-down engineer, uh, which is probably what most of you are looking for. Um, so we're looking for even more of a superstar with greater capability. Uh, but right now, we're, we're, we have shortage and scarcity. And we're reaching overseas, where where there is far more engineering talent, you know, in yeah. the in the um, essence being produced. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your 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 roles here. Um, uh, and if anybody did not get a chance to talk about the diversity thing, we can weave it in as we go along. Um, you all have big roles, and uh, you mentioned that not everybody's an overachiever and not everybody is a leader, but everybody on this panel is. Mm -hmm. I would say we don't have any underachievers <laughs> here. Uh, so in your current job, how is your success judged? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'll start on that. I think um, for any sort of public officer, it's obviously the success of the company and how you um, and how you uh, sort of uh, lead in in the organisation, as well as you know how you recruit talent, how your function, because I'm obviously CFO, so how the function performs within the organisation. There's a lot of that. Um, there's also a lot of um, I think assessment in terms of. Uh, 
you know, how innovative we are with our uh, business partners and the business in terms of ensuring that the, the strategy is being delivered on. And it's not just measuring after the fact, it's also proactively working with uh, the different parts of the business. So I think there's a whole raft of different things that, um, that we look at in terms of whether, you know, um, not, not only am I being successful, but across the organisations being <laughs> successful. What's a typical day like for you? Is, it, is there much repetition or do you get up in the morning and say, I have a lot of what? variety. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I can honestly say I'm never bored. Okay, so uh, lots of different variety depending on the day. It could be, um, you know, working uh, with investors, doing, um, you know, IR roadshows, working on earnings calls, working uh, within the organisation on uh, developing the ta talent strategy for the finance organisation or real estate. Uh, we're building um, a new campus, so how is that uh, going? What's the look and feel of that? What sort of culture do we want in that organisation? Uh, today we did a, an executive listening post session where uh, we have employees come in, uh, talk about different things. There were three of us from uh, executive staff there to actually uh, field any question, didn't matter what it was, so, um, you know, on what was uh, going on. So a lot of variety, a lot of um, pretty interesting stuff all the time in terms of uh, different things. Uh, a, 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 a variety of near-term things as well as, you know, strategic longer-term things. Laurie mentioned earlier, and the reason I brought this up is, you know, looking for, you know, the employees at Facebook, even in an individual contributor role, this capability of dealing with change and creating change. So let's talk more about your roles and, and what drives success for, you, for your, your job. Well, being in internal IT and at Microsoft, it's a unique uh, position because not only do you deliver IT solutions, you also dog food. And that's what we very much do at Microsoft. We call it dog fooding, is the early versions. Dog of, fooding? Yes. And do you my, bark? <laughs> <laughs> we actually do. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> when we don't, don't like Don't tell it. anybody. Yes. <laughs> we, um, one thing, before any, of, any customer of Microsoft gets our software, it has been tried to death in IT itself. And so we'll take early version. That's very difficult because you're yeah. constantly working with different bills and we're trying it out internally within our own organization. So for example, we've just decided to move our human resources evaluation um, uh, tools to the cloud. I mean, cloud is one of our biggest strategies. We're moving it to the cloud because what happens is all year round, nothing happens on those tools. And then all at once, 95,000 people go on to it in the last half day to put in their reviews. And that starts to <laughs> kind of create some volume problems. And then we normally and babysit And then they all it. call you? That's right, they do, all of them. And uh, we typically would surround it with a lot of extra hardware, software people, we moved it to the cloud. And the elasticity of the cloud will allow us to be able to deal with those spikes. And so how we're judged by how I'm judged by um, my boss is really how well did I enable the strategies of Microsoft. My team is responsible for ensuring that we understand what the strategies are and that we look at all the demand that comes in and make the right selection and help our clients make the right selection. We're also judged by how satisfied our clients are with IT. So we actually put out a survey and I am, it's one of the things I'll be paid on is, how happy are our end users with the um, service that we provided them? And then also, of course, I take very seriously my, uh, my uh, role as a leader of the team. And how, how well do we bring our talent along? How much planful talent movement have we done? And how have we grown and developed our people? So, so let's, let's peel that back a little bit. You know, you're sitting at the table and you, know, you decide one of these products the dogs aren't eating the dog food. Yeah. It doesn't pass the dog fooding test. Yes. Do you have, can, can you pound on the table and say, hey, hey team, you know, this is not ready for prime time? Yes, we do. And what happens when you're the initial naysayer versus uh, the yay-sayer? Well, you have to realize it is somebody's baby and you're calling it ugly, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we do. But, you know, and I would say there's a good agreement between the product teams and internal IT. 
I mean, the reason they're giving us their early version is so that we can test it out. And we'll say, look, we tried it in this scenario. It simply isn't working. And you need to do this, this, and this. And they'll take it back. And so there is a cycle of feedback that goes back to them. Um, and there will be a little bit of pride there at times. But that's the whole reason we're there, we're, we're the final I would say frontier for a lot of these products. And so that's why a job in IT, not that I'm recruiting, is a great job uh, to have because you get to do both internal IT and, and product development in some ways. So Barbara, you've got the word labs in your title. I knew you were gonna ask me about that. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, how, how do I get compensated? Um, it, it's actually a real, and I was, it was really funny when you mentioned some of the uh, things about you know campus expansion, I'll get to that as well. Um, it's really across, pretty much three different dimensions. One is the area of uh, innovation and what comes out of the various labs sites uh, that we have. We have about 25 in North America. You know, what are the different things that are coming out and how are customers adopting it? Uh, the other one is how do we, um, how do we help our uh, uh, on-site sales teams in terms of bringing customers in and helping them close deals? And uh, then a completely different dimension is um, employee engagement. Um, mm -hmm. How, uh, what are the services that we are providing to the employees on campus uh, to keep them happy, engaged, and make sure they don't wander off to Facebook? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so one of the things that uh, that we're looking at is also Should they just wander off. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, so a, a typical day can sort of uh, you know uh, encompass anything from talking about uh, we just held a workshop today about how can we keep employees engaged and motivated and what are things that we need to do around there to uh, what does our campus need to look like five or ten years down the road and mm -hmm. how do we need to expand it and what does it need to look like to also foster innovation and collaboration amongst the teams and that sort of thing to um, you know be speaking in front of a customer or the media or you know it's it's a real variety in the day, and that's something personally that, that I really enjoy, mm -hmm. um, to, to have that breadth in, in any given day uh, of topics and, and, and sort of keep thinking about different things. Right. What about you, Laurie? How many yeah, people do you have to hire in the next week? Wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think for, for me it's really, you know, I'm judged by whether or not we have the right people in the right place at the right time. And you know, do we have the right people to build the products we want to build, to you know, create new things? Are we are we driving innovation? You know, it's sort of all if you if you follow back the chain, it sort of all comes back to how did we recruit and how are we doing and keeping our people. So you know, I think it's those two things. It's basically you know who we're hiring and how engaged our team is, and um, you know, it means different things for different people. But I think it it is at the end of the day, if we don't have the person we need to work on X, then somewhere I haven't done my job. So we, as venture capitalists, we look for big markets, but we also look for great people. And certainly any of you could walk into any venture capital firm in the Valley and pitch a new company. Has the lure of a startup, I know, Lori, you've done a startup before. Have you ever thought about a startup? Or do you think about that on days where the organization feels big? I have a, have a startup in the family. My husband has a startup. So <laughs> it's kind of okay. I, I, I know the dynamics. I know all the ups and downs. So it's kind of nicely evens out a bit. Me too, my husband. <laughs> to him. Well, and, and I started uh, in a family startup. So, so way back when. So I've seen small, small businesses and I've seen them grow as well. So um, yeah. Well, you know, I've had the amazing opportunity um, in my previous career of doing startups within a large organization where you literally were given six people and said, go make six million dollars, right. something very small, and see how it grows. And point. it's so satisfying. And, you know, I did take one of those businesses and grow it from six, six people to 850, and you were hiring like 50 people a month. And it's wonderful do it, to do it in a large company because you're kind of on the side, but you're also well protected, so you have less of those ups and downs. But what you have to realize then is the failure is of a different kind, yeah. right? So when you fail in a large company, you really have to master the art of failing well. <laughs> and there is an art of failing well in a large company, and whether it be a project or a startup. And for me, 
It is that, you know, the, the real pivot point is when to pull the plug. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to wait till it's gasping for breath, damage is done, and nobody will want to touch the talent that's associated Sounds with like it. Sounds like you're ready to be a venture capitalist. I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's where I think um, the startup within a large company certainly has its safety net, but it also has a huge, you know, lens on you, and you can come out pretty damaged if you don't know how to fail well. Yeah, it's, I think that's a really good point in terms of how do you provide that, on the one side, the safety net, and what are some of the criteria you're putting in place so that mm -hmm. it's clear to everybody involved what are some of the, the, the gates that you have to go through. And uh, we've got something internally called the, the business incubator where mm -hmm. um, we're, on the one side, giving people a bit of a, uh, more of a playing field to start to, to try very different things um, that might not fit with our current business model that are a little bit further off the wall to kind of also protect them from kind of traditional things or traditional ways of doing things. Um, at the same time, uh, then looking at, you know, reaping some of those innovative ideas that come from there and how do we then sort of integrate that into the, to the larger portfolio and then sort of apply some of our more traditional mechanisms to then help it scale, which I think is then another beauty that the uh, the sort of startup within the large organization has that there's already mechanisms and infrastructures in place to really then help the the sort of um, you know beautiful little idea to to really gain mass adoption, which is something that is often quite hard for for the real startups yeah. to do. Yeah, and uh, we've had similar experience. So um, you know, we went entered into the switching market a couple of years ago, and it was a brand new market for us, and the the um, the team internally, uh, you know, we created a separate BU for it to actually uh, create that environment. And they brought those products out, they're doing really, really well. And we've also, uh, as a company, as many others here have done, you know, taken dollars and invested outside of the company in, in smaller ideas yeah. that are out there that, you know, may have legs over the longer term. Um, we've also acquired uh, companies in the last 12 months that we did have investments in as well as things, um, you know, came to fruition. So yeah, we do similar Yeah, things. I think, you know, I, I think that is part of, um, you know, the whole uh, innovation engine, you know, whether it's inside or outside or, or how to uh, keep doing that as a company matures. And, you know, we're 15 years old, SAP's older, and obviously Microsoft's a lot older than that. But I think, um, yeah, yeah, and even with IBM having their 100 year anniversary, you know, a couple of weeks ago, that keeping that innovation engine going over 100 years is uh, quite impressive. And it's really interesting in terms of how do you have and leverage kind of different channels right. for innovation to sort of not fall into the trap to say we're going to all do it internally. Yeah. Um, and which is, uh, you know, A, hugely expensive and B, you know, very you know, very risky to say, you know, what are the different channels of innovation that we want to leverage between our own teams, partners, customers, mm -hmm. how do you create the, the, the sort of what we call our ventures arm, which is more investing in companies that are a little further removed from our core, but that still bear some relevance to what we do to uh, more the incubator side of things. And mm -hmm. um, so it's really sort of how do you keep a portfolio of, uh, of innovation channels open and how do you keep them vibrant and, 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 and yeah. sort of bi-directional? Um, especially for, for as the company go, grows larger and, and matures. So, Lori, in, when you're in a hyper growth situation, and you know you, you've got a lot of young people at Facebook as well that have young tenures at the company, H how do you help people be successful, and how do you tell what the failure points are, uh, and how do you figure out? Who are the rising stars in sort of the hyper growth new company? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think um, a lot of it for us is just, you know, to keeping the, the generation that's coming out of school kind of right now over the last five or six years and probably for the next 10 years is really very different from, it's, first of all, it's a very big generation. Mm -hmm. And it's really very different from the generations that have come before. And, you know, I think what they're largely looking for is impact, flexibility, and autonomy. And you know, we hire people who, who want those things and who thrive in an environment that provides that. And so I think, you know, your first gate is sort of at the door, <laughs> which is, you know, are you hiring the right people and bringing them into the organization? And, um, you know, I think 
it's, it's very, you know, we tell people on your first day, we expect you to have an impact. You know, you're here to have an impact. There's no take a quarter or two to figure it out. It's like, you know, you're, you joined as an engineer, you're shipping code your very first week. So, uh, you know, people sort of, there's a lot of, um, you know, we have hackathons, which sort of give people a chance to try out a bunch of things or, you know, build a bunch of things that they've been thinking about. And, you know, very often ideas will rise to the top and, you know, and sometimes the great ideas are coming from, you kind of see it coming from the same person over and over again. It's like, wow, this is really a, this one's a gusher. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's like, there's just, you know, you kind of, you can, you, you see it, you just see it happening. And it's such a transparent organization. And uh, because we've built really strong social connections inside the company, and we're small enough that, you know, that's, we've been able to do that, and we use our own product to do it. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of visibility and a lot of transparency, and it isn't about, you know, who's the most senior person and what did they bring. It's about, you know, what did you build last Thursday during the hackathon? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they stand up to describe it, they can't just stand up to describe it. There's no PowerPoint. There are no slides. It's, here's, here's the product that I built. Let me show you the, you know, let me show you the demo. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that really, it, it drives and surfaces a lot of the great ideas, and it helps you kind of figure out, um, you know, where you can look next. We actually mm -hmm. do a similar thing in terms of uh, sort of what we call innovation challenges and no PowerPoint allowed. Yeah. It's uh, you have six minutes. If your demo doesn't get the story across in six minutes, that's too bad. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very similar, actually. So it's very clear that all of you are really great communicators. Uh, were you at the beginning of your career or did you have someone coach you in uh, public presentations? Did you, you know, was it a natural capability you had? Because certainly that's one for a venture capitalist. I mean, entrepreneurs live or die on the pitch. And you feel sort of bad when you know it's a great idea, but the entrepreneur can't communicate it well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about these great communication skills and how you got them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how you honed them, and how you help other people build them. Well, I, I can go first on that. Um, I started actually very young. Uh, my mother used to put me into elocution contests. Wow. Right? <laughs> and uh, this was in Pakistan, and you would stand up and you would recite in front of a large audience because she thought that was a good thing to do. <laughs> and um, then very, very much encouraged me to go into debating. And so mm -hmm. I became a public debater and was actually uh, a champion public debater. And that gave me a level of confidence and then also pushes you. I mean, it's pretty nerve wracking, like when you're 16 and you're up in front of an audience of 1,000, you pull a topic out of a hat, and now you've got to speak four minutes on it. And then someone's going to do a rebuttal, and you're going to do a rebuttal back. And you know, it's nervous at first, and it's also very exhilarating. So I guess it was because I sort of got into those situations that I developed the skills to be able to talk on my feet. So I didn't receive a lot of coaching, but when I have uh, teams who do, you know, you say if you just had this one thing, because you're right, you're so right on that. In the end, what you are is represented by your words, right? I mean, that's all that can represent you. And I, I have found people to benefit greatly from coaching or being videotaped and, and having it played back to them, for instance. Boy, have I got an opposite story of that. <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm, I'm completely at the other end. So. Um, very, very shy, uh, would not have uh, said boo to anybody. In fact, I was on the debating team, but I was the person writing out the answers and handing the ideas <laughs> to the person so they would go and speak. So um, completely the other end. And, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm good at what I do and um, I get it done. Actually, uh, working on the communication is something I've, I've spent a lot of time on. And, and to me, I think that's part of, uh, as, as an individual, that's what you owe yourself, right? Um, picking on the things that you can do better at and actually going off and, and working on it and, um, you know, getting the help that you need, whatever it is, um, whether it's communication skills or whether it's math skills or don't understand a P&L. In my f field of work, that would be a bit of a disaster. But if yes. you're in a different... <laughs> if, if you're in, you know, if you're an engineer and you don't know which end of the P&L is up, then, then you need to go off and find out. And so I think um, it doesn't matter what the skills are. I, I agree on the communication side because if you can't uh, you can't lead a team effectively if you're not um, communicating well you can't uh, 
I think, uh, deliver in terms of any of the roles that any of us have, unless you get those ideas across. Um, but I think no matter what the skill set, if you, uh, you know, the first, first path to success is actually identifying that you need to improve it and having that trust circle of people around you who call it out and say, you know what, you might just want to go and get a bit of coaching on that or, or mm -hmm. you may need to go and take a class on financial acumen. I think that's really important. Yeah, Robin, that's so amazing. I mean, for those of you who have never listened to an earnings call of a public company, you know, whenever I listen to one, I, I think of the CFO and how terrifying that might be, <laughs> how the value of the whole company hangs on your words. So it's interesting the position you have today. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you, do you get stressed before those calls? Oh, no. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think, you know, it, um, you know, I've been around people a lot who are so at ease getting up and talking. Um, and, and you think, you know, they must be just natural. Um, you know, in Australia, that would be, they must have the gift of the gab, right? So they can talk underwater or anything like that. Um, but the reality is um, most people who are good at public speaking actually are terrified. Um, but they, they overcome the fear and get out and do it. Uh, and it's the practice that actually helps. And so... Uh, from from uh, you know my perspective, whether it's earnings calls, doing a presentation in front of uh, this audience, or it, it's actually the the practice feeling confident about what you're talking about, knowing what the answers are, uh, you know, on an earnings call, that type of thing that that actually helps a lot. So. Yeah, I mean, I grew up learning that practice makes perfect, so I've practiced a lot of things a lot, um, and you know, and, and that's the way I develop my team too. If if there's someone who wants to be a better speaker or who I know needs to be a better speaker, then I have them go speak instead of my speaking. And I, you know, sit right in front and I take careful mental notes and afterwards I pull them aside and give them, you know, here's what went really well, here's, you should think about this, you should, you know, think about that. And I ask others to do it for me too. And so after almost every event, uh, you know, I'll have somebody that I can ask, you know, what did you think? How did it go? What would you have done differently? And I think you sort of collect all those bits of feedback and eventually they sink in. Yeah, mine was a bit of a sink or swim approach. Um, I grew up in Germany where um, in university you do not get any practice at public speaking or mm -hmm. presenting or anything like that. It's all pretty theoretical. And um, I then jumped across the Atlantic, so not quite as far, <laughs> um, and uh, for business school. And uh, I, will, I, I will always remember this, um, that it was just a sink or swim, you know. Um, all of a sudden, class participation is 30% uh, of your grade. And uh, you either start speaking and communicating and trying to get to the point or, you know, you don't. And and uh, I actually went through some of those speaking classes in school, and I was terrified uh, when you first get videotaped and you see yourself presenting on a tape, and it's like, oh my God, don't ever show that to me again. But it was really <laughs> that kind of, you know, that experience and that feedback that you get. And uh, so throughout my career, um, I then became a management consultant where, again, you know, you can't be a management consultant if you can't get your point across to the client and if you can't communicate with them. And so it was then just after the sink or swim, just a kind of constant honing. And uh, I think it's one of the most important skills anybody could have no matter if you're you know a CFO or you're marketing or an HR it doesn't really matter I mean if you can't communicate then you're then you're really stuck and I think um, so so for for any virals uh, roles that I get in or whenever uh, what I do with my team um, I sometimes probably drive them a bit mad by saying you know don't give me the slides don't give me uh, the, the nitty gritty, mm. um, give me, you know, if you saw me in the elevator um, or the person you're trying to reach, give them a, the, the good old elevator pitch and start your, your short story first because that's so, that's so much harder to, uh, to really b boil it down to what are you trying to say maybe in a minute or minute and a half rather than the one hour, you know, PowerPoint presentation with 60 slides. And so that's always something I'm trying to sort of, through which I'm trying to hone the skill of the team to say, let's, let's make sure we can be really concise uh, in, in what we're trying to say up front rather than starting with all the mind-boggling details up. Yeah, and I, I would say um, the technical professions, it doesn't matter whether it's engineering, finance, any, any of the technical professions, particularly where there's a lot of jargon, all that sort of stuff and acronyms, um, most of your time, particularly when you're um, a senior person in that field, you're, you're actually talking to people who lo know a lot less about that subject matter area than you do. So, it, you know, in the VC world, I'm sure you're hearing from engineers who are rocket scientists in whatever it is that they're doing, maybe building rockets, I don't know. But um, 
And we, so we just funded a rocket <laughs> from our flames. But. Yeah, well, and the, the reality is um, th- they try and get that out there to you to convince you that they know what they're talking about, whereas the reality is it needs to be, you know, tailored for the audience. So, yeah. So we've got about five more minutes before we go into wow. Q&A and all <laughs> questions are open. So I know everybody gave a lot of thought into coming here and since I'm the substitute moderator, <laughs> I just want to ask each of you, you know, what important message you'd like to leave our audience with tonight? You can take a few oh. minutes to think about this. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, if you're meeting a uh, young woman or there's a couple young men here as well, uh, and, you know, you, you would want to say, look, the most important thing I've learned during my career so far is what? Well, I, I would say it is to very carefully think about what success means to you. I often talk to individuals because I mentor a lot of individuals. And, you know, when I say what is success, and, and they will quickly take the attributes that society has sent to us through the media, the big job, lots of money, the big car. I said, is that really what success means to you? And if it does, that's okay, right? Because those are good attributes as well. But what does success mean to you? And I want you to sit back and think about what it means that at the end of your life, are you really thinking, was I successful? And it meant this, 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 and this. And then once you've done that, you want to align every action you take to the ambitions that are articulated in your success story because then every choice you make will be guided by that. And there is no way that you will not be successful if you define what success means to you versus letting society decide what success means for you. Yeah, I would look at it in terms of what are you passionate about um, and really knowing um, what really gets you motivated and excited in the morning. Um, Because that has a, you know, if you're pursuing a job that doesn't give you that, then, you know, there's no point to it um, if it's not something that really gets you personally motivated. It doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. Mm-hmm. It's really about do you know what really gets you excited? What are you passionate about? And does your job allow you to do that um, to, to keep you going? Because otherwise, you know, it's really hard to be productive and, and energized um, you know, at your job. I, think it, I do think it's really important to do something you love. Yeah. And that can be you know, it can be lots of different things. So it's not necessarily measured by rungs on a ladder. You know, it's, uh, you know, at every juncture, if you stop and think, is this something I'm really going to love? Then, you know, you'll do well at it because you love it and it will open another door. So I think it's, and, you know, we spend a lot of time working. Exactly. (laughs) So if you don't love it, it's really unfortunate. And, you know, I think over time, the opportunity costs become higher for you as other things are happening in your life. And, you know, when I've seen my girlfriends drop out of the workforce, it's because they didn't love the job that they had at the moment that they had to make the decision about whether to go back to work after maternity leave. And I think if you are in a position where you don't love your job at that moment, you will not go back because it's just not worth it. So I think, um, you know, I think the people I've seen who really love what they're doing are outliers in their areas. And I think that's, you know, it depends how you define success, but um, you know I think that's one way to just think about the path, not you know how do I get to the next rung, but am I doing something that I love? Yeah, I mean I I think it's a very consistent theme. I mean my whole motto is you know live life to the fullest. You only have one of them, most of us anyway. So um, <laughs> and so uh, do what it is that's really driving your passion, and whether that's work or not work, or you know I mean who said. Uh, you know, that if you're doing what you love, it's not work anyway. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, really knowing what that is, getting in touch with yourself and making sure that it's really what you want to do. Um, and the other thing is keep investing in yourself. Um, you know, again, whether it's, uh, you know, what you do at work or at home, if you're not putting the investment into yourself, then no one else is going to, right? So, and whether that's getting... Uh, help with a particular skill set that you need or whether that's um, getting backing for a particular idea that you want to you have that you want to take to market um, unless you're prepared to invest in it it's not gonna you know no one else will no one else will back you unless you back yourself so having the confidence and courage to do what you think you really want to do or what you believe in 
Well, this hour has gone by very fast. Very fast. And, uh, <laughs> You know, none of the questions were set up, so I learned a lot about each and every one of you. So before we go to q and I'd like to ask for a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> we have mics on either side, and you can address particular panelists or however you want to do this. We're, we're captive. <laughs> I wanted to go back to the diversity issue we were talking about earlier. So a few weeks ago, I read an article in the New York Times about MIT, female MIT professors and how they feel about their jobs. And something that struck me as very interesting is that they mentioned that in industry, women are expected to, be, to have a very narrow personality range. If they're you know, a little gentler, they're considered too soft. If they're a little more aggressive, they're considered too aggressive, you know, too bitchy. I'm sorry for my language. Um, and, and so uh, this seems like a, a, a cultural defect, a societal defect. And how do you, what do you suggest we do to address something like this? Because I find it very rare that men are considered ever too soft or too aggressive. Um, so so I, I can help. Uh, I think with it. I think one of the things you've got to do, doesn't matter who you are, you, you've got to be true to yourself. Um, you obviously um, shouldn't curse in public or, or, you know, all that sort of stuff. But but I think you've got to be uh, true to who you are. You can't put on a personality of somebody else. Uh, I mean, that would feel very weird um, and very tiring for that matter. Because <laughs> if you're not true to who you are, then it um, you're, you're sort of uh, putting a facade on every day, and that's incredibly tiring. So I think, um, you know, in terms of personality, um, you know, changes, <laughs> all of that sort of stuff, that's incredibly difficult to do. So I don't know what the article was about, but I'm not sure that, that I would agree with that. I mean, look at this room. Uh, I didn't comment on the diversity um, piece before, but look at this room. I don't think we have a diversity issue, right? So I think that, um, and it comes back to what you were saying before, uh, I think the more opportunities uh, we have of working from the inside, I'm a very big Trojan horse type person, not a, not a virus person, but, a, <laughs> but <you> know, <laughs> from a management philosophy pers uh, perspective, um, you can't change things unless you're in there. Uh, on the inside changing things. So the more people we have um, that look like us, uh, that are actually in the management positions, in the leadership roles, the more it's going to feel normal that we're there, right? And the more that we can actually influence what's going on uh, in uh, making those talent decisions, bringing that diversity of thought uh, uh, bringing that whole perspective into, um, you know, the different uh, leadership uh, parts of any organisation. So, um, you know, I'm, maybe I'm just an optimist, but I actually think um, over time it will fix itself because we will change it as we're in the inside. Does well, that make I think, sense? Yeah, yeah, and I think the solution really boils down to, and this is what you're saying, is critical mass. Yeah. When you have critical mass of females, then that the, then the attributes become the norm mm -hmm. versus yeah. the the corner case, and that's what if we could get if we could address the systemic barriers and increase the amount of leadership we have, then it becomes just quite normal. Yeah. And, and you'll have. I mean, on our leadership team right now um, mm -hmm. at Juniper, we have five out of twelve that are women. Four out of twelve that are women. That, that we don't have a problem with diversity. I mean, seriously, in the organisation, sure. Um, does engineering look the same way as the executive table looks? No. Um, should we be working on that? Absolutely, right? But, but I think, um, you know, we have a role to play in changing that as much as anybody else does. And I feel pretty good about that. I think yeah. we can. We and will. Yeah. And it's also the fact that, you know, there, it's not the one size fits all. Right. You know, there's, there's different roles with different skills that are required. And, um, you know, I don't think it's an either or. It's very much the question of, you know, how do... Uh, how, the, the things that are required are changing. There's, we talked about this earlier. There's a whole new generation 
uh, coming in that actually has much less of a, gener uh, of a, of a, of a gender divide, quote unquote, yeah. than current or previous generations might have had. And it's becoming much more normal for women to be in the workforce and to be amongst the, you know, the executive ranks. And it's, it's the kind of what, what can we all do to kind of keep the momentum going in yeah. terms of the talent decisions that we're making, the talent recommendations that we're making, the influencing over um, what are the talents that are bubbling to the top and, uh, and, and do it, to your point, do it from within. Yeah. I also and talked, I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier that you know, the current, the generation that's coming out of school right now has really no division between their professional persona and their no. personal persona. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know, for a, an organization that has a lot of these people, uh, you know, it, it's very much about bringing your authentic self to work, whatever that is, because, you know, it's out there and, um, and, and it's all about kind of sharing and um, kind of socializing and and building social connections even at work the same way that you know my generation you really didn't do at work as much and uh, and I, you know, I think it's just changing and I think that the whole mindset actually is changing around bring your authentic self to work and uh, and that leaves room for I think a lot of diversity that that wasn't there maybe even a little while ago so I think there's you know I think this is actually probably heading in the right direction yeah and I think when you when you talk about bring your authentic uh, self to work and then look at the outcomes so what is the outcome that you want through the authentic self and be striving to do things like impact and influence? It doesn't mean you have to be aggressive. It doesn't mean you have to be loud. It means being very deliberate about being authentic to yourself and, and having the outcome, for instance, of impact and influence, having the impact, uh, outcome of dealing with ambiguity and demonstrating that, being yourself. And so if you are also outcome focused within your own personality, I think you'll get the, I think women in general will be able to get the, the right stereotype because that's, that, you know, that is what they were talking about is the stereotype. It was a great question. Thank yes. you so very much. We've got one over here. Yeah, um, you are all very wonderfully inspiring. So thank you for, um, for sharing your views because I think they're amazing. Um, and one thing that I think really resonated with the audience was the point made about the system has to change. Um, and a system, of course, is not a living creature, which means people drive culture and culture and people drive the system. So I'd really love to hear from every one of the panelists, if you wouldn't mind, about what your philosophy is in mentoring and how you go about mentoring. I know you, you touched upon it um, just a, a bit, uh, Shal, but I'd, I'd love to hear everybody's perspective on that. So, I mean, I've been uh, on, on actually, I think mentoring is one of the, 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 the best things we can do in an organization um, outside of, you know, all the, the processes and the system, uh, because it is at the end of the day about people and how we share our experiences. Um, personally, I've been on both sides of the mentoring equation and uh, no matter if I'm a mentee or a mentor, I always learn a ton. Um, and in terms of when I'm a mentor, the, the kind of questions that get thrown at me where sometimes <laughs> I think, oh my God, you know, I haven't really thought through that much uh, to, through that question and it's a really good one and I learn an incredible amount through that. So I actually think this is something that um, we need to do much more of uh, in terms of, uh, of, of mentoring because it also helps incredibly at breaking down some of the internal barriers and silos it helps people create new relationships, which then are incredibly important, especially in a large company, to kind of, you know, figure out where, where do you want to work next and what are the, the kinds of things you would want to do there. So it also opens people's eyes about what opportunities exist. And so I think that's really a, a core uh, element to drive a whole variety of things uh, from, a, from a people perspective, from a culture perspective. I'd say I really believe in real relationships through real work. So I've seen less success and I've experienced less success myself uh, when people are paired with strangers. Mm -hmm. So when it's sort of a more artificial, you know, we're having, we're going to build a mentoring program and we're going to take this person over here and match them with this person over here. It, I haven't seen it work. Um, and so for me, you know, it's really more about looking around and thinking about who are the people that you have real relationships with who really know your work and know you so that they can give you real feedback and they can look for opportunities and help you think through things and you know can be a coach when you need it and i think you know i think increasingly these are not um, unidirectional relationships oh, i think it's yeah. you know very yeah. much uh, you know i have um, 
as many kind of coaches at Facebook who, you know, sort of, I think, probably first thought I might coach them, but honestly, I probably get more value out of those relationships than they do. And so I think, you know, kind of just changing the mindset around where it comes from. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think, um, I think that uh, I've had experience on both formal mentoring um, situations that have worked really well. I've had some not so uh, great experiences on that front. And also, uh, you know, just the personal interaction. I, I think it does come back to connecting with different people and whether it's, um, uh, you know, you acting as the coach or the other way around, it, it, it's always uh, bi-directional in terms of what, uh, what you learn through that experience, irrespective of which side of the table you're right. on. Um, but I also think, um, you know, it comes back to the theme I was talking about before. If, if um, there's something that you uh, don't know how to navigate or um, you have a particular skill in and um, can help other people with, I mean, paying that forward is a huge uh, thing. So I think, um, you know, uh, mentoring is, a, is an often used word to cover a lot of different things, both informal and, but learning from others, I think, is, is the key to everything. And it doesn't matter whether uh, it's a formal or informal relationship. I think it, it's um, a great thing, right? Well, and I, and I would add to that and say, you know, given that the question came in the context of fixing the system, one thing that I personally do, and I mentor deliberately both men and women, is make sure that I mentor people that I feel um, I, I can believe in. Because I will not only be their mentor, I will be their sponsor. And there is, you know, the mentor advises and the sponsor pushes for. I mean, the sponsor is ambitious for you. So if you're lucky enough to get a sponsor, they will be ambitious for you. Of course, the ultimate sponsor is your mom, right? She's always <laughs> ambitious for you. And, um, and, and in terms of advancing careers, if, you, if you're mentoring people who you believe in, you have absolutely no hesitation when names are put forward for high potential programs, for promotions, uh, for interesting roles to say, have you thought of? And that's something I would ask everyone to consider is when you're picking a mentor, is that person going to be your mentor or are they also going to be your sponsor? Yeah, yeah I think for us as venture capitalists, the majority of times, our executive teams are doing the job for the first time. The first time CEOs, the first time CROs, the first time CMOs. You know, so we're dealing with raw talent. And what we like to tell our executives is you should practice standing naked in front of the mirror at night. <laughs> and because really, the kind of relationship that Lori's talking about suggests a level of openness, trust, and confidence in not only, you know, trying to achieve, but really being confident about what you don't know and sort of self-assessing where you have room to learn. Mm -hmm. And that's where we see failure the most with our young executives is that, you know, they, they don't want to acknowledge that they might actually, you know, have to hire someone to fill in a gap versus trying to be perfect all the time. So, uh, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, I think it is challenging to stand naked in front of that mirror at least once a week. <laughs> Hi. Um, the, the panel has spoken today about uh, the search for talent and also uh, the diversity issue. Um, I'm interested to know uh, from everyone on the panel whether you have had any involvement in the past in going into schools, perhaps um, speaking to students and inspiring them to go on to bigger and better things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've done it just twice in the last probably six weeks or so. Um, both to actually both to groups of girls um, in middle school and high school, and I think uh, and actually in very different communities. Um, so I think it's uh, you know I think it's really important for them to see role models so that they can you know I think it's hard to I think you get you achieve what you visualize for yourself, and if you have trouble visualizing it because you haven't seen anybody else do it. Uh, it's very hard. So I think it, it's, you know, I feel like it's something that I owe back is to be able to provide that to someone. Uh, you know, even if it's just a couple of people in an audience, you sort of think, oh, wow, maybe I can actually do that. You know, I think the voice in your head is more important than anything else. And, and if we can help influence the voice in someone's head, then, you know, that's a job well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same here. I've, I've done it as well. And, uh, 
you know, I, again, it's one of those bi-directional things where, um, yes, the main purpose is to kind of share your experience with, uh, you know, a group of, you know, young girls or young people. Um, and at the same time, my experience, you always get an incredible amount also back, yeah. you know, just by the sheer questions that get thrown at you, which, um, you know, sort of send you back to when you were that age. It's like, yeah, how did I think about this? And, um, and I, I find that tremendously rewarding. Mm -hmm. It's also energizing. I mean, I, I find, because uh, I've done it um, as well, just that particularly, it depend, depends on the age, but particularly in that middle school um, sort of age when they're still uh, um, in touch with the world and not, not sort of anti everything, um, it's actually, <laughs> it's quite energising to, um, to sort of be in front of them and uh, having uh, questions thrown at you, um, particularly, you know, with a different accent, you know, in front of um, different people, I find it pretty good. Pretty good. And and you get you get an idea of the myths that are out there. I mean, I stood in front of a, a group of uh, grade eight, and this is about 1999, and I can still remember one young person telling me I'd never go into technology. You know, as I was writing on the whiteboard, why would someone go into technology and why wouldn't they? And I said, why not? And he says, well, my back will ache all the time. I'm going to be hunched over a computer. <laughs> so I'm not going into that. So it was kind of interesting perspectives. Yeah, one of the other generational changes, and I'm sure Laurie will agree with this, is there is not a college graduate today that has not, during their undergraduate years, also done community service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even college rankings, yeah. rankings today are based on how, what percentage of the students perform hours of community service. So it's creating a gap between those of us who went to college and just went to college. Uh, and the, the new employee at, at, our, at companies really is expecting that they have jobs and they do service at the same time. Mm -hmm. And they have families and do it all. So it even puts a higher pressure on us to look at the time we have and figure out how we give back to our communities because it is being baked into every 21-year-old that graduates and joins our companies. They expect that companies will have programs for community services, that there might be foundations they can work with, that there'll be events around community service. And that expectation comes back to us as uh, leaders in industry that we have to do the same thing and we have to find time for that. I've spoken at seven campuses in the last 120 days yeah. and it's, it's oh. fantastic. Yeah. It's Hi, um, thank you for coming and sharing your thoughts. Uh, not that, uh, don't get me wrong, but uh, not that I want to take up your job or anything, but I would like to know how did you get there? What all things you did which was different than, than others that you, you are so successful where you are? Maybe I can derive some formula for myself and, you know, <laughs> learn so, out of it. So, Shala, we left, last left you on the debate team. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so what country were you in then? I was in Pakistan at that point in time and made my way to Canada. And, you know, if I were to sort of do my uh, quick synopsis of how I got to where I am, I started off as a developer and thought I was like the best thing since sliced bread because I certainly knew how to develop code. And yet I had my eye on an executive position. So one thing I will say is I always knew where I wanted to get. I just didn't know how to get there. I just truly didn't, but I kind of knew, knew where I wanted to get. And I had a mentor who said something to me that was very meaningful. Um, so I was talking to him, and he says, uh, Shala, you need to become the business manager to the CIO. I said, why would I become the business manager? In these veins are bits and bytes, <laughs> not dollars and cents. Why would I become a business manager? And he said, you know, the words I remember to this day, and this is like 20 years ago, he said, you know how to do IT, but you don't know how to run IT. And so I became a business manager on faith and hated the first three months. Though I have a business degree, and so it was not that difficult. But what I finally understood, and this was at a time when IBM was going through its uh, almost, uh, you know, bankruptcy back in the early 90s, that actually if you combine the knowledge of IT and the business degree, you could actually make certain outcomes happen. And then I went through actually and became a finance manager, a controller, went into network services, and as IBM was growing its services business, I was right there and managing and, and uh, becoming an executive in those businesses and then landed up in Microsoft. But I have done HR, I've done finance, I've done 
uh, services, I've done IT, and so there have been a number of things. And I think breadth helps, so if you were asking specifically, I would say having uh, a resume that reflects multi-disciplines, mm -hmm. I found very helpful to getting to the goal that I wanted. And yeah, I'll, ec I'll echo that actually, where, uh, I mean, I started my, uh, my actually very first job was in banking, uh, believe it or not, and uh, then I went on to, into uh, consumer marketing, where I went, uh, spent my first couple of months actually doing um, ethnographic research on teens, which was, uh, you know, fancy speak for hanging out with teens for a whole summer and figuring <laughs> out what they're doing and how that might be relevant for a company like Coca-Cola. So, and I wasn't getting paid for it. So, um, but jokes aside, so, uh, but, and then I went into management consulting, you know, uh, where you learn a whole host of other uh, skills and you get exposed to, to other industries and other challenges and you have to be sort of quick in terms of you know, sort of understanding what's new in the industry that you have your new project in, and um, actually came to the uh, to the IT industry a little bit through the back door by um, actually having the chance in in management consulting to apply a lot of things that I had learned in consumer marketing and apply them to more you know technically focused companies. So um, and uh, you know and that sort of multidisciplinary kind of background between you know in my case marketing consulting some finance. Uh, then I also went into product management and solution management. Um, I think that sort of breadth kind of, you know, really helps you understand a business more holistically, which then can set you onto, onto a certain path. Robin, did your family expect you to join the family business? Um, actually, no, the opposite. So, um, so my They kicked you out? Uh, well, <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. So my brother actually was the one who was anointed to the, um, to the family business. Um, no, so so I actually, um, as Anne was saying, uh, my parents had a business. Uh, they started the business. I worked in the business. I actually managed it while um, summer vacations from school and uh, university. So I was always very uh, focused on business. What and all was that the sort business? Of stuff. Uh, it was actually a garage. So a garage with um, uh, workshops and that type of thing. So. Um, so that's why I love cars. And uh, so I actually was at Anderson's uh, for a period of time after I'd uh, got my degree in, in uh, economics. And then uh, went to Toyota because they rang and I said, yes, <laughs> <laughs> car company. If Ferrari had rung, it might have been even better. But um, so, so I ended up at uh, Toyota for about eight years. And, and I think, you know, more specifically on your question, one of the things that, um, that I think uh, more than just any discipline or any particular path is actually curiosity. Curiosity about how things work, why they work the way they work, and not not getting fobbed off with an answer like, you know, how does electricity work? Well, it just does. You know, but but actually going through and understanding how, particularly for you know a finance professional that ends up being you know CFO, you, you've got to uh, you've got to keep going after the answer until you're satisfied that you know what it is, right? So, um, and so I think, uh, you know, from an attribute perspective, that's something that I've always had. You know, I'm Robin with a why, and the reason I have a why is because I'm always <laughs> asking questions. And, and, and it's true, even today, I mean, my a couple of my, my team members are here and they're nodding, right? So, so it's, well, why does it have to be that way? Or why is it that way? And what's, you know, what's, um, how can we do it better? Or, or what, what else can we do in that, that situation? And why is always easier than no, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So it's why before it's no sometimes. So, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, no, I mean, I would just echo, I, you know, I say this all the time actually internally at Facebook, which is, I think it's a jungle gym, not a ladder. You know, I think it's about collecting experiences and, and it isn't always about the next move up to the next title. It's sometimes just about um, kind of broadening your experience set, your skill set, your perspective on things and branching out a little bit. And it's, you know, you might find yourself sort of, um, as I described myself to Anne earlier, an accidental tourist in something. Um, <laughs> But, you know, you just sort of never know where it's going to take you. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's very much kind of serendipity along the way. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, linking back to the question about the schools, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to, uh, you know, kids who are in school and stuff, the reality is um, they're going to change their minds 47 times before maybe even they get to college, let alone when they're going through college as to what it is they do. And then once they've actually done something, something in college got their major, by the time they finish their career, it, they're going to have, you know, 
10 different changes probably. So I think, um, you know, going back to being authentic, making sure you're following your passion, whatever the path is, doesn't really matter as long as um, you're collecting the things along the way that you need for the ultimate role that you might uh, aspire to or the next role that you aspire to, that type of thing. I think we've got time for one more question. Oh, wow, I'm ending it. I, <laughs> I hate to put us back to such a gender-specific place, but it's a women in tech roundtable, so voila. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm not sure if any of you are mothers. It's not in your bio. But um, I particularly what, one of the things Lori said about people she knew dropping out of the workforce after you know, maternity leave because it wasn't necessarily something they were passionate about. I feel like that's also true for women who do things that they are passionate about because they somehow have to make a pivotal choice at motherhood about whether or not they're going to be a good mother or a good boss or a good whatever it is that they do. So, you know, I kind of wanted to get a little bit of your thoughts on that. Like, did you have nannies? Do you have nannies? Are, you, uh, are, you, are your kids in daycare? Were they in daycare? Do you feel guilty about it? Do you <laughs> I mean, there are, are there are a lot of things as a person who's you know, younger in my career, but I see all these amazing women that I work with who somehow manage to do it all, and I can't even balance my own life right now, and I'm only responsible for me. So, <laughs> so Shala, you could turn it over to your daughter. No, I could indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to add something? The mic's... <laughs> no, let's, let's, give Nadia, let's give Nadia the, the mic. I, I know you've been bursting at the seams and proud of your mom tonight. So. Well, well, maybe you, you could first answer and then <laughs> no. I could give my perspective. Okay, well, I mean, certainly I don't think I was the perfect mother, but I did, I did not give up on my career. Um, I was very, very focused and um, did get the help because I didn't think I could be a super mom and do it all. Right? So what I did was I made an investment at a time when I was not making a lot of money, when she was born 27 years ago, and um, got a nanny and did, uh, got a wonderful person to help. And I also had a wonderful husband who also helped at home. As, you know, and so that was one of the solutions I had. And basically, I was turning my entire salary over to her. And there were times that I would, I did, it was, because That's by right. the time you paid her salary, um, this was in Canada, workman's compensation, you know, the Canadian pension plan, et cetera. My entire take home went, but I was investing in the future and it paid off. But I would tell you, it was something I really loved doing, much as I loved my child. And so now surprise me, Nadia. <laughs> okay, well, from the child's perspective. First of all, Nadia, introduce yeah. yourself and what you're up to these days. Okay, so uh, my name's Nadia. I'm the daughter of this lovely woman. And um, because of her efforts in her life, uh, I now work at Google in, as a social media Wait, specialist. I don't know if that's successful for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, no, but which is funny because today we were having a conversation as I took her for lunch and she asked me, you know, what is success to you? And we have very now different views of success. So yes, I'm in success right now and, I, you know, we're agreeing on that. But, you know, my vision of success is it has skewed a bit uh, recently as I've discovered more as you grow. Um, back to uh, being a child of, um, you know, and, and growing up in a household uh, with, a, we had a live-in nanny, which was, you know, which was our family too. And I think I remember mom just bawling when, when we had to get rid of one nanny and it was, she was, you know, family to me. Um, but, you know, to be really honest with you, my mom was always there for us. You know, she would always come to events when she could. You know, there were some events that she couldn't come to. And I would, you know, why didn't you come see me play drums? That's not cool. And she said, well, you know, I'm in New York. And, you know, there was, you know, instances when she was in New York and would fly back on the weekends uh, at IBM. Was it at IBM? Hmm. And she was at IBM and she would, she went there in uh, Westchester or something like that. And she'd fly back every weekend just to be with the family. Uh, so, but one thing I remember growing up and reading an article, I was maybe 12, maybe 14, and there was an article and it was about her and I was reading it and you know, one, one thing that it said was that, you know, for me to be where I am today and concentrate on my career and love my career, you do have to give up some things and that's why we did get help. And at that time that kind of hurt me that, you know, they, sh I had to read or I read that. Uh, that your career in a way was more important to you than being at home with the family. 
But now, but I mean, I understand now. I mean, I got to go to snowboard camp. I got to go on vacation every year. I got, you know, I got, I got to do my my masters in digital media. So, so she got her sports car. <laughs> no, but the, the great thing about how she raised me is she it was kind of almost business like. Anything you want, you know, give me a proposal. Show me the show me the value. Why, why that I'm at Microsoft? Do you need this Apple computer? You know, why does, why, I don't get it. You know, you need to prove it to me. And so, and so, and then look at me. I've learned so much from her. I, I'm watching, I'm sitting here right now. I'm like, oh my God, you've become your mother. <laughs> and, and yeah, I think that if you just, you know, go about it like how you want to do it and just kind of be there for your kids and keep your ears open for them. And, you know, she was always there. I mean, I once got sick and really sick. I was really sick and I went to my dad and I blew up in hives. I was like, the hives, you know, I think are like this big. The hives were like this big and I was in the hospital and she flew right home and she was there for me. And so she was able to do both. And, you know, there might have been struggles and things like that. And, you know, there might have been, you know, gaps in a relationship, but, you know, we're at a great point in our relationship. And, you know, I'm doing great, she's doing great, and we're all just great. So that's, that's kind of Nadia. what it is. <laughs> any, any closing comments? Uh, I guess this is our one question about life-work balance. So a couple quick comments on that as we close up. I have a very young child, so I'm, a, I'm fairly new to motherhood. He's uh, just a little bit over two, and, uh, you know, it is... You have to make some choices, and you, you make choices on a daily basis where, you know, sometimes there's events in the evening that I would love to go to, um, where sometimes I opt out and say, you know, I, I really want to be at home and, and, and spend time with my son. Uh, on the other side, you know, I didn't want to give up my career either um, because I think actually it makes me a more balanced and a more balanced person and hopefully with that a better mother um, that, uh, you know, tonight I, I can't be there. And, uh, you know, you have to have a, you know, it's all about teamwork. You have to have a team in place um, where, um, you know, my husband is, uh, is an entrepreneur. He's a little bit more flexible, so he can uh, step in here and there. If you work in a large company, you don't have all that much flexibility, even though I have to say I'm fortunate that I can take some flexibility in the, the, the times that I work and, you know, some work from home and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to have some sort of, you know, infrastructure in place and, you uh, um, you know, and try to balance it out, and you know, it's tough, you know. Um, I'm not gonna lie about it, you know. There's, there's moments where it's like, you know what, I'd much rather be at home now, uh, and there's moments where it's like, you know what, it, it's good to be here and at work, so. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think one of the most important decisions I made for my career, actually, was choosing the right partner. Um, you know, I think, honestly, you know, uh, I think if you choose the wrong partner, you will make very different decisions. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we're definitely, my husband and I are definitely 50-50 at home. Yeah, same here. Um, you know, someone gets sick and has to go to the doctor, it, you know, 50-50 that he'll go or I'll go. And, um, and I think that really takes a lot of the pressure off me and allows me to do a lot of the things that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Um, but I think it's, I think it's really, you know, and it's important. And it's also important on the hard days, and there are a lot of them, when, you know, to have someone else say to you, you know, it's a hard day. Tomorrow will be better, you know. And, and I think there, there are also some things that you just have to let go. You know, my house is not always clean. The laundry is not always <laughs> done. I, you know, I do actually, I am admitting this, you know, will occasionally take a shirt out of the hamper to put on a child in the morning. You know, it's like <laughs> lots of cereals are fortified. It's okay for dinner. You know, it's like, <laughs> I think if you just... It, you know, if you just ask yourself what really matters, it's sort of those aren't the things that matter. But if you if you make those the things that matter, you're going to drive yourself nuts. So yeah. I think it's just, you know, I think it's those two things for me is sort of realistic expectations and having a partner who carries half. Yeah, so I have, uh, I have two kids, 18 and 23. And um, as we speak, they're doing a road trip up the coast of Australia. So, so... Um, so they're doing uh, well. And, you know, I would echo, you know, there are lots of different choices that you have to make. And, um, you know, I, I chose, uh, you know, to do what I, what I do and, and have the family. And, and my words, uh, you know, there is no such thing as balance in life. Um, it's about integrating the different things that you want to do in this 
great full life that you have and um, and then make it work, right? Um, I'm going to steal a line from one of my colleagues at work where, where she says, you know, apart from love, outsource everything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's fabulous, right? Because that's exactly what you do. I mean, I, you know, you, you do have the nannies. You do have the extra help. You, you, um, you know, and the other thing, someone mentioned the word guilt. Get rid of it. Don't, don't even think about the guilt. You've got to, you've got to do uh, what's right for, for you and your family and work and everything else and make those decisions and um, and and I think everything else will take care of itself. Well, in, on my team I've asked all of my team members to come up with a work-life balance plan because what we first thought was, because it's a common question that comes up and it's not just women, it's men as well. So what I would tell you is for every child there is born there is a father who cares, right? And they struggle as much with raising the child as the mother does. I personally have many on the team who also, and they may not articulate it as much, but they certainly struggle about and they want to be with the child as well. And so everyone has come up with a work-life balance plan because it means different things to different people. But picking up on the guilt point, I think it's very important as employees of an organization to give yourself permission at times to do things for yourself. And sometimes we don't give ourselves permission, right? I mean, thinking, oh, we really cannot leave at 4 o'clock. Yes, you can, right? I mean, because you've done, if you have the work-life integration, you've done, you, you're not cheating the company, right? And, and, and so that's where having that plan, giving yourself permission, and um, feeling okay about it. You, yeah. Lots of people have done it, and you can do it too. So on behalf of the Churchill Club, and with special thanks to Microsoft, but amazing thanks to Barbara, Lori, Robin, and Shala uh, for sharing so much about their careers and about themselves. And I think our big tip of the night is, other than love, outsource everything. Yeah. <laughs>